The sermon of the hour will be brought to us this morning by Brother Gary Summers. He will be speaking on Christ confronted error about heaven and hell. Gary has completed 40 years of preaching as of June 2012. He served congregations in Pennsylvania, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Texas, and Florida. He and his wife, Barbara, have been married some 47 years. They have two children and four grandchildren. He has the Master of Arts degree in English Literature from Illinois State University, and he's taught English composition at the college level. He is currently teaching for Truth Bible Institute. He videotaped three series for World Video Bible School prior to 2005 one on the New Age movement, one on angels, and a lengthy study on sin. His articles have appeared in a number of publications. He's also published a weekly article in Spiritual Perspective since July of 1995. This material and other features is available at www.spiritualperspectives.org. He's written and edited the 5.5-year Chronological Bible Odyssey, which is a Bible study curriculum that covers from Genesis to Revelation in five and one-half years. So Gary's offered a lot of good material. His articles are very thorough. And now we're glad to have you here, Gary Summers, in preaching on Christ's confronted error about heaven and hell. Brother Gary. Well, I'd like to echo Lester Camp on his comments about the graciousness of the congregation here. Nobody who is visiting could uh, possibly feel mistreated. Everyone is uh, so kind and does so much to make everyone feel welcome. I'd like to also echo his lesson on the Sadducees. Well... <laughs> no, uh, between Lynn Parker <laughs> giving the background on the Sadducees, and that was just great yesterday. If you didn't uh, have a chance to be here, uh, you should really see it uh, on the video. And uh, between that and uh, what Lester said today, uh, all of the background has already been given for what we're going to talk about because... The Sadducees were materialists, and we're talking about heaven and hell, and when Christ confronted them on that, those subjects, it was very real. They did not believe in the resurrection, and so that doctrine needed to be confronted because it was not hypothetical, it was very real. And, of course, uh, if somebody's not going to believe in heaven, what are their odds of believing in hell? Jesus taught plainly that both heaven and hell are spiritual realities. We'd like to deal first with heaven this morning. Eternal life is the compensation that God gives a faithful Christian life. Heaven is the place God prepared for the one who has prepared himself for it by making every effort to be holy as God is holy. Heaven is the place of rest for those who have worked and worn themselves out in service to God. Jesus promised treasures in heaven, Matthew 6 and verse 20. The material things in this world that we have are only really to be used in glorifying God. True spiritual riches shall be given to us all later. Jesus refers to the Father in heaven about 15 times. So how is it possible that anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus would say they don't believe in heaven. The Father is in heaven. How is it possible that it could not exist? Of course it exists. Furthermore, there are more than 30 references to the 
kingdom of heaven in the New Testament. Despite all of these scriptures, however, Satan still tries to convince people that heaven does not exist. Why would he do so? His purpose is to convince those who might choose to believe in and follow God that they will not be rewarded. And so he does not want anybody to believe that heaven exists, that there is a reward, that God does care about us and will reward the faithful. The book of Revelation teaches that Christians facing torture and death were comforted by the promises of ultimate victory and eternal life. Jesus himself makes several promises in the book of Revelation in the seven letters to the churches. We're not going to go through all of those, but here are a few that come to mind. Number one, the eating of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God, Revelation 2.7. Second, being given a crown of life, Revelation uh, 2.10. And uh, third, being granted to sit with Jesus on his throne, Revelation 3.21. These are just a few of the promises that are made in the book of Revelation. Later in the book, the new Jerusalem is described as uh, coming down from heaven. And it's described in great detail, beginning with uh, Revelation 21.1 through chapter 22 and verse 5. So all of these rewards, along with uh, the tree of life, will be granted to, according to Revelation 22.14, those who do his commandments. Those who do his commandments. It's not granted to those who uh, have had some sort of a, quote, salvation experience where they said, oh, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, and, and I just felt saved after it. And then they give no thought to the Bible, to the Word of God. They give no thought to worship, but they believe they're going to be saved. No, heaven is a reward for those who do His commandments. Who is the one who would dare try to rob Christians of their rewards? Well, obviously Satan. He does not want anyone to have a reward. Therefore, he tries to deceive everyone into thinking they, uh, he will not receive one. Satan and his servants are masters of sowing seeds of doubt. Seeds of doubt. Satan has always impugned God's character. Remember the Garden of Eden? When Satan presumed to tell Eve that God was withholding from them the knowledge of good and evil and that that was something they really needed and they really would desire, God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to have the knowledge. He doesn't want you to be blessed with the knowledge you'll have when you receive that. Satan always impugns God's motives. And so he gets people to doubt the reward, to doubt heaven itself. Now, the atheist declares that he knows that heaven does not exist when he cannot prove any such thing. The agnostic doubts that heaven is real, but his musings are worthless. The materialists, like the Sadducees, they do not believe in life after death, and therefore they do not believe in heaven. Therefore, there are no rewards, according to this type of thinking. So for that reason, the materialist tries to accumulate everything he can here on earth. Well, if there's nothing else, you may as well get all that you can here and now because that's the only reward that you'll ever have, according to Sadducean thinking. Now, there are those in that category. We see what Satan tries to do, and we see that atheists play into that, and agnostics play into that, the Sadducees play into that. 
But there's another error, and that is the error of an earthly paradise. Although heaven is described in terms of earthly wealth, glory, honor, splendor, the Christian knows that these are simply symbols of what we may expect when we arrive at heaven. On earth, such things as gold, jewels, they symbolize the richest and the best that there is. However, heaven stands above all the best that this world has to offer. Heaven is God's dominion. It's a spiritual place that far exceeds our imagination. One would think that heaven would be the goal of all spiritually minded persons. However, there are some who don't have that as a goal. For example, Jehovah's Witnesses do not see it this way. According to their theology, heaven is already filled up. And there's no more room there. I guess they need to rewrite John 14, 1. In my father's house are many mansions, but, but they're all filled up. But that's their thinking. And you might say, well, are they disappointed in that? No. If you've ever talked to one, they're as excited as they can be that they're going to live here on a renovated earth. In fact, I even had one say, I, I don't, you know, heaven doesn't even interest me. I'm going to be excited to be on this renovated earth. In other words, they think that having uh, a physical life on, on a physical place is just as good, if not better, than heaven. To the Muslim, heaven is a physical place also. Here's a few things that the Quran teaches. These are they who shall be brought nigh to God in gardens of delight. A crowd of the former and few of the latter generations on inwrought couches, reclining on them face to face. Uh, blooming youths go around them with goblets and ewers and a cup of flowing wine. Their brows ache not from it, nor fails the sense. I take that to mean you can go ahead and get drunk and it won't bother you. You can have all the wine you want, drink all you want, and your brow will not ache, nor your senses fail. And with such fruits as shall please them best, and with flesh of such birds, see these are not symbols. These are not material descriptions of splendor that symbolize the greatness of heaven. These are actual physical things they're talking about. And with the flesh of such birds as they shall long for, and their eyes shall be the huris with large dark eyes, like pearls hidden in their shells in recompense for their labors past. That's uh, Surah 56, portions of verses 11 through 23. Here's more. On couches with linings of brocade they shall recline. And the fruit of the two gardens shall be within easy reach. Surah 55, 54. Therein shall be the damsels with retiring glances, whom nor man nor jinn hath touched them before. Surah 55, 56. But the, pi uh, but the pious shall be in a secure place amid the gardens and fountains clothed in silk, and richest robes facing one another. Thus it shall be, and we will wed them to the virgins with large dark eyes. Surah 44, 51 through 54. Enter ye in, and your wives, into paradise. Delighted. Surah 43 and verse 7. Everything is physical, and it's intended to be physical. It's not symbolic. They actually expect these physical rewards. So to the Muslim, paradise is a physical place, as we have seen described. And the reason is that their religion is a physical religion. It is primarily physical and hardly anything spiritual in it. Conquering lands, plundering caravans, killing infidels is their task. And... Uh, in the book, you have some references where you can find that in the Quran. 
The work of Christians, however, is spiritual. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, 2 Corinthians 5.10. We use words, ideas, logic, which comes from God, by the way, and, and to uh, make a comment to those who seem to disparage logic. We only have logic because it comes from God, who is himself logical. So we use those things rather than force to try to convince others of the truths that the scriptures reveal to us. Our emphasis is not one of battle in a physical fight, but one of evangelism. Our efforts are put into teaching. Our acts of benevolence are designed to help others. Christianity, when practiced as taught in the New Testament, is helpful and beneficial to all mankind. It has no destructive aspects. Even our opposition to error is for the good of all. Some people, I think, have the idea that uh, some brethren are just mean and like to get up and tell other people off. The motive for exposing error is the love of all mankind. We do that because error cannot save anyone. Those who remain in error are lost. They need the truth. Jesus said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Error won't do that. John 8, 31 and 32. And so that is love on the part of those who teach the truth and fight against error. We want everyone's spiritual well-being, not only ours, not only our brethren's, but those who are still outside of the body of Christ, those who are even our enemies. We want everyone's spiritual well-being, and we labor toward that end. Jesus confronted the physical view of heaven when answering the materialists who had supposed that heaven was just a kind of continuation of those uh, like us who live here. He pointed out it is a spiritual place. And to the Sadducees, who didn't think it existed at all, he pointed out the truth of the matter. As has already been said, they had this uh, uh, question that they posed that, Probably, uh, as Lynn said, the, the Pharisees had never been able to answer, but Jesus did. And they assumed that in another world, marriage would be just like here, just, just like Muslims later would come to that conclusion. But Jesus told them that they erred, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. They did not understand for whatever reason or did not want to understand for whatever reason that there was a resurrection, maybe they said, well, who is powerful enough to raise the dead? And the answer is, God is. He is powerful enough to raise every individual who has ever lived from the dead and to bring them into judgment. People do not marry. They're not given in marriage in the next world, Matthew twenty-two thirty, 30. Marriage is not part of that because marriage was designed for this earth. Marriage was designed uh, to bring a man and a woman together in a physical way as well as other ways. And it was designed also to uh, enable the human race to propagate. Spirit beings do not mate. They do not have children. You don't read of any angel families in the Old or the New Testament and their children. That's not something that happens or occurs because there is no need for that in the spiritual realm. However, in saying that, Jesus indicates that the next world will not be of a physical nature. This one is, but the next one will not be. And the food will be spiritual. We will partake of the tree of life. 
And our worship will be spiritual also. The harps are symbolic. They convey uh, melody, uh, perhaps rhythm, things of this nature, but, uh, and beautiful sound. But that's all that they are is to convey those things. They are a symbol. They're not going to be literal harps in heaven. No one will be disappointed. We will all rejoice in that new environment. Now one other thing we want to say on the subject of heaven, and that concerns the error of overconfidence. Jesus also taught that the majority of mankind will not be living in heaven. Now, the majority, few there will be that find it. Many will go into the way of destruction, Matthew 7, 13 and 14. However, many people seem to believe that they are saved. Jesus told us the truth concerning that. And people really need to come to a knowledge of what Matthew 7, 13, and 14 says. When Jesus declared this reality, he was not happy about it. In fact, how could he be knowing that he was going to offer himself up and go through the ordeal of the cross and suffer greatly and intently, uh, intensely on the cross he was going to do all of that. Do you think he could then be happy about people being lost? But Jesus told the truth. Jesus showed people reality. And reality is that most people are going to choose to be lost. And yet, despite this truth, many people are just as confident as they can be that they're going to be saved. We uh, did some door knocking a, uh, a couple of years back, and we had a series of about five or six questions that we asked people. Most people didn't seem to mind answering that. We, we told them it'll take about a minute. No, okay. One of those questions is, how confident are you of your salvation? And we put that question in to get people to think. Because a lot of times people will say, well, I'm saved, but we wanted them to think about it. How confident are you of your salvation? And then, of course, the response that we hope to make was uh, if they said, well, I'm not really sure, is what would you like to study so that you can know and be confident? However, when we asked that question, most people said, oh, they were very confident of their salvation. Even if they didn't know anything about the Bible, even if they didn't attend worship anywhere regularly, nevertheless, they were confident that they were saved. The devil has done an excellent job in convincing people that they are saved if only they just at some time acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. Satan keeps them satisfied with the additional lie once saved, always saved. How sad that so many are, have bought into a lie of the devil and are confident that they are saved. So confident they don't need to study the Bible. They don't need to discuss anything. They've just been convinced that they're saved and not lost. The devil has a great ability to convince people of things that are not true. The fact is, however, that just because we think we are saved does not prove we are saved. We have to go to the source to find out if we are. We have to know, what does God say on this? Not, not what did some guy on a radio say, uh, made me pull over off to the side of the road and say, oh, Jesus, I, I, I need salvation and and I want to belong to you now? You can't go by what some guy on a radio says, and especially when it doesn't even make a lot of sense. We need to know what's in the Word, and that will help us to prepare for heaven. The fact that we cannot earn salvation does not mean that God expects no positive response whatever 
Remember those who do his commandments. Heaven is a place prepared for a prepared people. Now we need to discuss the other real alternative to heaven. And that, of course, is hell. The most common misconception is that hell does not exist as a spiritual place where the souls of people will be tormented after this life is ended. Many people do not believe that. If you take a survey, you'll find that some people believe in heaven, but very few believe that hell is a real spiritual place. There is a second uh, corollary that goes along with that, and that is that among those who believe that people might be punished, many of them only believe that it's just going to be extinction. They're not going to be tormented day and night, forever and ever. They'll just cease to exist. Now, these doctrines are not born out of reality. They arise from wishful thinking. This is what man would like to be true. This is not what God has revealed. It's wishful thinking. The, for many, the doctrine of hell is too horrifying and too appalling. They earnestly believe that no loving God could have created such a place as a human inferno for human beings. The fundamental flaw with this approach is that it requires man to sit in judgment upon God. Shall the being that is created tell his creator that he is unjust? At least when Abraham thought that the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah might be too severe, he put his protest in the form of questions. Would you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? These are questions and uh, Abraham did find out, however, that God did know what he was doing in the destruction of these places. And uh, that he had more information than Abraham had on the subject. Those who are opposed to the biblical doctrine of hell don't pose questions like these. They arrogantly affirm that God could not do such a thing. Of course, man is never as wise as he thinks he is. We'd like to paraphrase what God said to Job and apply it to this subject. And uh, so here is what we come up with. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when sin entered the world? Tell me if you have understanding. What is the appropriate punishment for sin? Surely you know. What is the right price to pay for sin? Do you know why hell needed to be created in the first place and where I placed it when all the demons wailed together and the fallen angels mourned? Who shut the fires within it and decreed its thick darkness? Who will be sent there and on what basis? Give me the answer out of your great wisdom if you can. Man is not qualified to question God. Man cannot sit in judgment on God. And the Bible tells us that God knows what he's doing from beginning to end. We should not question him on this. We can understand it, but he still knows what he's doing whether we understand it or not. Sin is a spiritual fact. Who understands what it is and how much damage it does better than God? It's a spiritual reality. God has more spiritual knowledge than we do. He understands how horrible and how awful sin is. We may not think it's that bad, but God knows the truth of the matter. Would man with all of his musings ever think that sin would require the death of Jesus on the cross as a price for sin? Would we have come up with that with our great wisdom and knowledge? 
Would we have determined that the blood of the innocent Jesus needed to be offered on the cross and that uh, the blood would need to flow from his side as a fountain in order to wash our sins away? John 19.34, Revelation 1.5, Zechariah 13.1. And would we have linked the outpouring of Jesus' blood to baptism for the forgiveness of sins if God had not explained it? Acts 2.38, 1 Peter 3.21. It is difficult to fathom what a council of men might have come up with as a remedy for the problem of sin, but it is safe to say that it would not match God's plan and therefore would be ineffective. Since man, therefore, could not and does not have the knowledge of God and could not match his knowledge in determining the correct price to pay for the remission of sins, then on what basis do we dare say that hell is an inappropriate punishment for rejecting the sacrifice on the cross for our sins? We cannot draw that conclusion legitimately. God is perfect in all his ways and whether or not mankind agrees, hell is a just punishment for sin. Jesus confronted errors of the past as well as those of the future when he taught about the place of destruction. And we notice that, first of all, in Matthew 7:13. The Sermon on the Mount is usually regarded as a great masterpiece of a sermon, which it is. And yet in it, Jesus assumes that people know about hell. He assumes they know about it. He doesn't define it. He doesn't explain it. He just refers to it, the way of destruction. And people seem to know what he's saying. But whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Nobody raised their hand and said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? We never heard of that. Matthew 5, 22, see. Shortly afterward, he stressed the need to discipline one's body and contends that those who do not shall be cast into hell. Matthew 5, 29 and 30. The only definition for the word comes from the meaning of it in the context. According to Jesus, hell is a place of fire and destruction. But he also taught more on the subject. Matthew 10, 28. He taught that the soul and body can both be destroyed in hell. Furthermore, God has the power and the authority to cast people into hell. Luke chapter 12, verse 5. Um, he mentioned hellfire again in Matthew 18 and verse 9. Jesus asked the scribes and the Pharisees, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Matthew 23, 33. In Mark 9, 43 through 48, Jesus describes hell as the place where the fire shall never be quenched, and where the worm does not die. Now those two may seem to be at odds, but uh, the image of this is the, the Valley of Hinnom, and there were fires constantly there, but there were also places uh, where worms actually did live also. But these are uh, symbolic of the actual hell that exists. Let's consider quickly two texts, Matthew 25, 41. Matthew 25, 41. Then he will say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now those who shall be sent there are first of all cursed, not by men, but by God who is the only voice who matters. Who are the cursed? Uh, why are they cursed? The reason in this text is because they lacked compassion, like the rich man who allowed Lazarus to uh, uh, deteriorate and die in front of his eyes, not lifting a finger to help him. In a broader sense, however, it would be anyone who has not obeyed the gospel of Christ. Anyone who does not know God or having uh, anyone having the correct knowledge, but choosing not to live according to it, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8. This fire is everlasting. In Revelation, it is referred to as the lake of fire. 
In the same passage, the lake of fire and brimstone is referred to as a place where the devil and those who will be joining him shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. If hell of, in, involved annihilation, why would it need to burn day and night forever and ever? Why would it need to keep burning? If everyone was annihilated, it would only need to be there a few days at most because there's not going to be anybody else to be sent there. Nobody in heaven is going to sin. There's not going to be people continually sent down there to continue burning. It's a one-time thing. All people are going to be there. If they were all consumed, why does the fire continue to burn day and night forever and ever? It's because annihilation is not true. Second, in Matthew 25, 46, we see the duration of heaven is the same as that of hell. And these go away into everlasting punishment. Notice, everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The same adjective is used in both cases to modify punishment and life. One may say everlasting and one may say eternal, but uh, it's the same Greek word. And so however long the one is, the other is. And uh, so long life is uh, going to occur in either case. It's going to either be a heavenly life or a uh, tormented life. Or actually, a constant process of death might be a better description. The inhabitants of hell are constantly in a state of death and destruction. Now, a third principle back on Matthew 25, 41 is that Jesus taught that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But why was it created? God established it as a distinct place, separate and apart from heaven. The two kingdoms are mutually exclusive. And uh, it's located in a place where heaven is not. The two realms will e forever be disconnected. There are no points in common in either, uh, between the two. The sectors are separate. And uh, the devil will be with those in hell. And the saints will be those rewarded in heaven. The penalty then is set. It's been determined. The reward has been determined. Two places, two realities. One rejoicing and reward, the other punishment and torment. Jesus and his apostles clearly taught that hell was a place of torment and that it exists. Satan offers up his best deceptions and lies to convince us that God is too loving to condemn people to eternal torment. They forget about God's holiness and about God's justice. He cannot fellowship sin. And therefore, his justice requires that the price for sin be paid. Now, Jesus paid it, but if you reject it, then you get the same punishment that Satan and his angels receive. Heaven and hell are the only two choices we have for our eternal existence. The only two. Nothing can be found in between, just as righteousness and lawlessness have no points in common, just as faith and skepticism cannot agree, just as truth and error cannot be made to harmonize. Neither can God make some middle ground between heaven and hell. Now the third error is concerning hell. Okay, it exists and it's eternal, but I'm not going there. Many people think that as per the survey we already referenced. However, the decision is not ours to make we don't get to render judgment upon ourselves god gives us this judgment and if we make the wrong choices 
If we ignore the word of God, we're not going to like that judgment, but we are warned of it ahead of time, and we have the opportunity to do something about it now. We have sinned, and we deserve punishment. But because of God's love, He wanted us to not have to endure that. So he provided Jesus to die on the cross so that we have a way of not having to suffer eternally. Through the grace of God, we have another option to be forgiven of our sins through faith and repentance and confession and being baptized and living faithfully unto death. If you have not made that decision, you have the two options set before you. And you need to make the one that will allow you to enter into heaven, not the one that is going to find you condemned. Satan will still bring temptations against you once you obey the gospel, but you can overcome them with God's help. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. As Jesus told the apostles, so is it true with the faithful, our names are written in heaven. If you have not obeyed the gospel, we invite you to do that very thing this morning. Maybe you're not quite sure what the gospel is. Maybe you don't quite understand how baptism and the blood of Christ and all of this relates together. There will be some brethren here who will help you in understanding that. And you need to let that be known uh, to them. But if you already know what you need to do, we invite you to respond this morning. And if you're a child of God, don't let Satan discourage you. Don't let him uh, get to you. Don't let him make you doubt what you know is the truth. Put him behind you and continue to reach forward to the prize that is before. If you're subject to the gospel invitation, please come while we stand and while we sing.